You asked for it. It's my job to deliver. This is another one of my subscriber request Tuesday video series where I'm going to cover 10 stocks that subscribers have asked me to cover. Now, you know, the truth is I can't cover all the many stocks that subscribers have asked. I wish I could, but I can't. There's hundreds of them that you've asked me for. What I try to do is I try to cover stocks that have either investing principles attached to them or teaching moments that can help you all be better long-term investors as a result. In today's video, I've got 10 stocks that are very, very interesting. I've got several that offer great teaching moments, but I also have a few hidden gems in here, some really great long-term investments. So you want to watch this video all the way through to the end because there's three or four in here that you probably would really be interested in investing in if you knew about them. So please watch the video. Anyway, this is Chuck Carnival, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation to many of you. Let's go ahead and get into the video. And I started with a portfolio review. Here are 10 stocks that I'm going to be presenting in today's subscriber request Tuesday video. I'm going to go through these in no special order, but let's go ahead and look at the portfolio review here of these 10 stocks. And what you're going to notice is I've got four consumer staples. I thought these would be very interesting because there are some interesting teaching moments involved in these. First of all, we've got some of the big brands, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. And then for that matter, Keurig, Dr. Pepper, which tend to have premium valuations. The A-plus rated stocks definitely end up having premium valuations. Then I've got some consumer discretionary like CarMax, and I've also got Brunswick Corporation, which is obviously, you know, in the leisure products business. And then I've got AutoNation on here as well. And then Fastly, which is an up-and-coming information technology, internet services, and infrastructure company. So there's a wide range of companies here. And as I said, some of them are really overvalued. Some of them are great investments, some of them not. So I'm going to go through them one at a time and try to present some teaching moments and some very important investing principles as I go through this. So let me start off here with Fastly. Now, I went ahead, I went through the external links, went to the corporate website and got on Fastly's website for you. Now, this company essentially allows developers to build, secure, and deliver more powerful websites and applications with what they call Fastly's Edge Cloud Platform. It's a very, very interesting company in that regard, and I think it has an awful lot of potential, okay, where developers can really build very fast, very robust websites, you know, for their various businesses. But here's the thing about Fastly, and what I really like about this particular company and why I like to show it, it, you know, came out in an IPO about May of 2019, and there's a very interesting pattern with IPOs that I see over and over again. They tend to come out and then in a, for maybe the next month or two, they tend to rise dramatically. So it came out at 20, immediately went to 30 before it then settled back down to 20 and stayed there. And even got down, if you go into March of 2020, got down to under 19. So really, it was a very poor performer, let's say, for the first year or so. Then all of a sudden, the stock gets hot. You know, the marketplace falls in love with it. The valuation or the, and the price rise astronomically. Then we have this big spike in correction. Then we have this another huge rise. And then since January of this year, the stock has fallen dramatically. All right. The problem here is if you look at the bottom of the graphic here, they lost 52 cents in 2019. Then they recovered dramatically, only lost 18 cents, but they still had negative earnings here. I want to make that clear. But it was a significant improvement. And so, you know, the stock price reacted to that. But then the losses built up again. Then they had their worst year so far or having their worst year so far in 2021 where they're expected to lose 62 cents. And that's like a 244% drop from the 18 cent loss they had in 2020. So this is a very, very dynamic company. Now, the reality of it is, fundamentally, there's nothing here to talk about. There's no earnings, so I've got no P.E. ratio. I can't really talk to you about what the valuation is because it's really almost infinite. Of course, the company pays no dividend. It has 48% debt, which isn't too bad, and it's got a $5 billion market cap. But I'm also going to look at something differently here, and I'm going to go to the new version of Fast Graphs, which isn't ready for prime time yet. But we do have a price to sell. I want you to notice I'm using close of prices on the 20th of August. So, you know, again, this thing isn't loading correctly. But nothing has changed very much. If I look at the current price, the current price is $43.60. 
Here I've got $40.90, you know, 10 days ago. But the key I want you to see here is the one thing going for this company and why it's attracting, I think, investors is sales are growing. They're, they've grown at almost 24% a year. And the company has historically traded at around this orange line here is around 19 times sales. That's a very, very high price to sales for companies. But I do want you to note that the company got up to a crazy 44 times sales in September. The point is, based on sales, the company is expected to continue growing their sales. The question is, when are they going to turn those sales into profits? Now, if I look at things like operating cash flow with the company, we're expected to see operating cash flow begin to improve and actually possibly generate positive operating cash flow by December of 2023. But a mere nickel worth of operating cash flow, still not enough to support today's valuations. The price to cash flow would be astronomical, even out at that price. OK, if I look at it from and I'm using this new version because it's fast. If I look at it from the standpoint of EBITDA, which is another form of cash flow, again, we're expecting about two cents in EBITDA in 2023, but that's still more than two years away from now. So the reality of it is, if I look at forecasting, the company is expected to have long term forecast growth of 30 percent. But here's the problem. How do I value that? OK, so I'm going to go to the forecasting tool here. And what I did was I said, let's give it some baseline. Let's put a dollar's worth of in this case, I'm using adjusted operating earnings for 2021, something that we can grow because you, if you grow a negative number, it just becomes a bigger loss. So I've got a dollar in here. Is this real? Probably not. But the company does have the potential to grow. So if we get some level of earnings in December of 2021, maybe this stock will become viable. Maybe now's the time to buy it if you're a long term investor and you'd be willing to continue to add money if the stock continued to drop. If I get a current quote on the stock as of today, it's up about 0.4%. Uh, it's up 17 cents so far today. So, you know, it is recovering a little bit. Would this be a time if you're a real long term investor? Investor and you believe in the future of this company, maybe you could take a position now. I believe if you're a prudent, more conservative investor like yours truly, you would wait and see where things pan out. But again, I think you'll have ample time in the future to be able to buy this stock at a reasonable valuation. It's a very interesting company. Looks like they have a great product. The question is, can they make any money and when will they start doing it if they can? And there's a bit, bunch of ifs there. So this would be a very speculative company. The teaching lesson here is just look how volatile the stock could be, especially if a company that doesn't earn any money. I think that's the real lesson that I want to give here. The next company I want to look at is AutoNation. Now, this is a very interesting growth stock. OK, what I want you to see here, if I scroll this back two or three years here, use my scroll functionality and look at AutoNation, I'm going to call it under historically normal times. OK, this company's grown at about 11 percent a year. The orange line on this graph is a P.E. of 15. You can see that the price has tracked earnings almost perfectly. It got very inexpensive, you know, during the COVID time, like most companies did, but then started to recover. But notice what's happening to the earnings. The earnings are skyrocketing. OK, and they've exploded over 117 percent estimated earnings increase for 2021, which, by the way, the company does have a, a December fiscal year. Why? Well, part of the reason for that is COVID itself. OK, if I look at AutoNation through the lens of this new version of Fast Graphs here and look at it from a standpoint of operating earnings, I want you to see real quickly that AutoNation is been, you know, just exploding on the upside. And if I look at the forecasting graph, it's expected to increase dramatically. What's happening here is there's a huge shortage of computer chips and used cars are trading at massive premiums right now. You can even look at another company, which really wasn't on the list here, but Penske Auto, one that I'm personally long on, which, you know, has, you know, car dealerships and the used car market and their dealerships is, you know, really driving the value or the earnings of these companies up here dramatically. So there is a lot of upside in companies like AutoNation. This is a speculation to an extent. It's kind of a COVID play. What I wanted to show you here was that all of this explosive growth is coming as a result of COVID and the shortage of chips. So they're having trouble delivering and getting inventory of new vehicles and used cars are selling at prices that 
you know, have been unprecedented, actually. So this is one that would be a very, very attractive speculation. The rates of return on the long-term growth is expected to be 20%. It is going to peak this year, and then we're going to have a negative growth rate in 2022 expected by the analysts. However, I do want to make a point. That negative growth rate is still going to be perhaps the second most profitable year in the company's history, okay? But when that happens, if the market starts to get shaky at that point in time, you could see some significant, you know, volatility in the stock price. So be forewarned of that. But anyway, there's Auto Nation, one of the other stocks that you've asked me to look at in these stocks. But you can see the, the incredible rate of return that this stock has already generated after bottoming out in COVID. It's already tripled in value just in a matter of from March of 2020 through you know, the July 30th of 2021, which is where I hit it there, the stock is up over 300%. Okay, so that's Auto Nation. Does look very, very attractive, but I would call it an attractive growth stock slash speculation. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I'm going to, call, I'm going to take a sh chance and call it Quidel Corporation. This company is Healthcare Supplies. It's been doing testing for COVID. Let's go to their corporate website real quick. And you can see they're providing the at-home you know, COVID tests. So this was a COVID play. You saw this huge surge. I'll shorten this time frame so you can see this a little better. You saw this huge surge in earnings, but now as COVID, you know, hopefully begins to pan out, analysts are expecting the earnings of this company to probably go back to being more normal. Okay. And analysts are forecasting negative growth, but they're still forecasting profitability. But that's more in line with what the company's historical profitability would be. So this is a special situation kind of an investment. What's happened to it is, you know, the long term growth, they really don't give any. If I go into Yahoo Finance through the external links here and see what they ask, they, Yahoo Finance does think we're, we're only going to have growth of about 7% going forward, that really wouldn't justify, you know, the high valuations that we're seeing here. Now, the PE is low, but it's aberrantly low because it's a blended PE. It's measuring earnings between $18.60 and $6.37 estimate here. So, you know, we're looking at something that's aberrant. It's not normal. And there was a, a short-term pop to be made in this stock, but then, of course, it's given most of that back already. This would be a very speculative company, but it also does illustrate the relationship between earnings and price. You can see earnings growth really was nothing for this company for all these years prior to COVID. Didn't even have a calculable number, and the stock price really didn't really go anywhere. Performance, you know, until they start having some explosive earnings was actually quite poor on this company. The next company is Brunswick Leisure Products, obviously bowling equipment, et cetera. Let's quickly go into the company's website here just so, you know, you, you get a perspective of what they do. You know, they have, you know, Mercury cruisers, Mercury diesels, boats, parts of sensory. It's the overview Brunswick company. Excuse me. It's, it's the, the Brunswick Corporation. Leisure Products are hot right now. People, I think, are desperate for leisure. Forecasts for growth are 20%. You can buy this stock at a very attractive P.E. ratio. Now, the earnings yield is only 5.6% because the earnings growth is expected to be over 20% going forward. This is the three- to five-year growth rate. That means at a 17.7 P.E., you've got a peg ratio less than one, if you will. You're using the P equals growth rate for the earnings. But even if you're using the normal 15 PE ratio, this company promises for the next two or three years to offer double digit rates of return for you. Now, you know, it's attractively valued. You can see that it did suffer during the Great Recession. I think that's important to point out. It did react to the COVID, but then as earnings began to accelerate and grow, we've had, you know, 17% growth in 2020 during COVID, followed by an estimate of 59% growth this year. And of course, the stock, you know, from the bottom of COVID here, the stock is up over almost 200%, 188%. There is an investment, a teaching point here and a lesson. When stocks are under, I just had a recent comment on one on my last article or one of my last articles where I said, be careful if there's a market crash, value stocks will fall as well. Well, there's a fundamental difference between a price drop and fundamentals holding up versus a price drop with fundamentals deteriorating. 
Okay, there are many, many stocks. If you recall what I showed you with AutoNation here, they had a little bit of issues during the Great Recession, but then the stock, you know, recovered dramatically. I think you're going to see the same thing with Brunswick. You know, it recovered coming out of the Great Recession. Earnings growth for the last 10 years or so has been about 14% a year. And look how the stock price tracks that. And again, you can make money even if you overpay for a stock that's growing very fast. You can still do very well. Here you could have you know, paid a premium valuation of PE of 22 and still made 11% a year and turned 10,000 into just under 20. If you waited, you know, happened to wait almost a year later, and bought the stock when the PE was 13 and held it to here, you end up turning 10,000 into almost 27,000 and end up with almost a 20%, a 19% rate of return versus 10. Valuation matters and it matters a lot, okay? And this idea that having to buy stocks when they're overvalued isn't necessarily rational. I believe that if you're patient, stocks will always come into fair value. The market is not always efficient, but it's always seeking efficient. Now, another one is ADCO, which is an agricultural company, which, by the way, is starting to pay a dividend. They paid a special dividend of $4 last year. You can see the stock price has tracked earnings prior to them starting a dividend, which they did in 2013. Right now, we've got explosive growth. They do a lot of business in China. I brought up the Morningstar report on it. They only give it two stars, but they say, you know, it posted solid second quarter results. The agricultural markets continue to be above mid-cycle. They talk about it's a pure play agricultural equipment company, which has been focused on providing customers tractors, will continue to be one of the top three players in the agricultural industry. This is just some notes from Morningstar. We do not think they benefit from an economic moat, despite the fact that they're the third largest agricultural equipment manufacturer. You know, established brands like Deer and Case, et cetera, were instrumental in mechanizing crop production. But, you know, they do not think they, that ADCO benefits from pricing power, et cetera. But the point is, earnings growth has been explosive. If you shorten this time frame, you can see that the company's growing earnings at over 25%. I'm not sure what to make of the dividend at this point because they did pay a $4 special dividend, but they're actually paying about you know, 20 cents a quarter right now, which would be 80 cents as far as a regular dividend. But anyway, Agco looks very, very interesting at today's pricing and today low. This is one that you asked me to look at. And there you have Agco. It's not one that I know a great deal about, I might point out to you. So do your own homework here like you should. Here's a REIT, Medical Properties Trust. We're looking at FFO here. I think this is a very reasonably priced REIT. It's got a 5.5% dividend yield. You can see they've got a good dividend record. I'll shorten the time frame to where since coming out of the Great Recession, if I look at performance, they've grown the dividend at a modest about 2 or 3%. They did freeze it for three years in 2010, 11, and 12. But you've got a good yield. They have a, a decent capital appreciation potential. But this is all about income, getting a 5.5% yield. This is the kind of stock that you might blend with stocks that offer more upside. You know, but having said that, it is expected to grow at about 5% a year which if it trades at a normal 15 times price to FFO, which it has on occasion, you've got a really nice rate of return potential. But if it only grows and it's 12 or 13, and here I'm using 11.3, which is the five-year average, I can use a 12 PE average and I'd still get double digit rates return. So there's a nice opportunity in Medical Properties Trust, which is a healthcare real estate investment trust with a very high dividend yield, moderate growth and moderate growth to dividend. The next one I want to show is CarMax. Again, this is very similar to AutoNation, you know, slightly different market, but it obviously is an auto, a retail automobile manufacturer. Note here, when you're looking at this graph, that long-term earnings growth has been spectacular at 37%, but you can see that growth is kind of, you know, more historical. If I shorten this time frame to say post the Great Recession, the earnings growth rate drops to about 14%, and now CarMax begins to look a little overvalued, if you will. And I think that's very, very important. Those of you who are Fast Graph subscribers, don't just glance at it. I always start with a long-term graph, and then I always shorten the time frame. And notice that the earnings growth rate is dropping and dropping precipitously here. And this gives me a better perspective of the current. But ultimately, I'm going to buy based on the future. Now, this is the three- to five-year trend line growth rate is expected to be about 20%. 
If I cross-check that with Yahoo, which you know is another source of estimates, and they're giving me 19.6% growth as well. So here the number is virtually identical. So if you bought CarMax today, you would be overpaying for it from a pure sense, but you could overpay for companies that are growing at 15% or higher, as I point out all the time, and you could end up making double-digit rates of return if you're willing to buy it, or you could be prudent and, you know, going into the more, you know, near forecast and wait for it, you know, to fall. I would love this stock at about $108 a share. It trades at 126 That's what I would be looking for. You, is it going to happen? I don't know. Let's check the price real quick just to see what's what's happening today. We're looking at it's down 1% today. So, you know, no biggie, but it's down in a moderately up market. But anyway, CarMax looks great from the long-term historical perspective. But it's the, the picture changes when you note the changes in growth rate that have been happening to the stock. This is a tool to think with. Use it properly. Now, I want to look at PepsiCo here. And this is very interesting. I want you to note a couple of things. PepsiCo has chronically traded at around a 20-ish PE. You know, this is the normal PE is 21. You know, if I change the time frame, it drops down to 19.79. But it hovers around this 20 multiple. Okay, here I've got 21.8. These are reference lines. These are valuation reference lines. The key point here is clearly by looking at this, here's right at the 20 PE using the 20-year graph. You can see that the stock historically trades at that. And if you buy it at a 20 PE, you pretty much participate fully in its growth. It has a great dividend record, the dividend since 2004, which what I got here has grown at over 11% a year on average or compound average growth is 11.5%. It's a, you know, it's a great dividend player. It's got a 2.3% dividend yield. Even based on its historical normal PE, I think the stock is overvalued. Let's go to the new version of FastGraph, remembering here that we're a little behind on it because this stock, this, you know, we're not quite finished yet, but we're getting real close to giving this to you. But I want you to note here that if I look at some different metrics, if I look at operating cash flow, you know, Pepsi trades at around 15 times operating cash flow, currently trades at around 19 times operating cash flow. COVID brought it right down. It would have been a great time to buy it, you know, because I think I do believe a high quality dividend blue chip um, aristocrat like Pepsi is worth looking at through operating cash flow. OK, I also want to look at it from a standpoint of free cash flow, which isn't so much a valuation tool as, as a dividend coverage. And the company, for the most part, has covered their dividend with free cash flow. But there are times when the payout ratio gets to be, you know, up here at 97 percent. You know, last year it was 98.5%. Otherwise, it's usually paying out about, you know, 49, 50, we'll call it 50% of operating cash flow. Let's take a real quick look at sales. And on a price to sales, this stock trades at around two and a half times sales normally. It's currently trading at just under three times sales. So, you know, it's a little pricey when you look at it based on sales. But once again, this is a premium multiple type company that I think gets a lot of credit for its brand. So you can buy it as a blue chip, A plus rated safe company if you're buying it for the dividend. But I would like to see the dividend yield around 3%. If I use my dividend overlay here, you know, if I'm patient, there's 2.6%. There's... 2.8%. If I bought it during coming out of the Great Recession, I would have had ample opportunity to get very close to a 3% yield that, keep in mind, is growing by 10 or 11% a year. Coca-Cola is almost exactly the same story. The difference here, because Pepsi does have the snack foods, etc., I want you to note that Pepsi has had more consistent earnings growth. Coca-Cola's earnings growth has actually been you know, quite abysmal, maybe, perhaps you might want to say, if you look at it from, you know, the standpoint of these down years here, you know, it was only growing at about 1%. Now, the stock did still command a 21 multiple, but I want you to notice there wasn't a lot of performance during this period of time. Almost all the performance came from the dividend, or certainly a significant portion of it came from the dividend rather than any type of real business performance. Long term, it's been a good dividend producer, but it hasn't really kept up with the market. But remember, measuring performance without measuring valuation is a job half done. That's because Coca-Cola was extremely overvalued coming in to the recession of 2001. And you always want to take valuation into consideration. I think it's overvalued today. 
Uh, it's got it does have almost a three percent dividend yield, but I'd like to see this stock, you know, a lot cheaper to interest me. I'd like to see it under fifty for sure, and I'd prefer to see it under thirty dollars a share if it was going to attract my money. We have a very similar situation with Keurig Dr Pepper which is, you know, the coffee brands as well as Dr. Pepper. Again, we can go to the company's website. This company has morphed numerous times. At one time, Dr. Pepper was a standalone company. Now they've got, you know, the Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. They've got the, you know, all these different coffee products here, the Kahlua drink. They got Canada Dry, A&W Root Beer, 7-Up, which was also at one time an independent company. So this is, you know, a lot of really great brands associated with this stock. It's been a momentum stock. Look how the stock price tracked earnings when it came out of its initial spinoff, you know, IPO at around April of 08. It was trading at 15 times earnings and stayed there. What a great time to be buying a stock like this. Now we've got these premium valuations in this very overheated market. That is something that's very, very dangerous, which leads me to my last and final subscriber request that I want to show you because here's where you really get teaching lessons. Here's Boston Beer. Now I'm going to scroll back here, you know, to looking at the company, Sam Adams, and you can see the relationship between earnings and market price here was very, very strong in most cases. You know, it tracked its earnings. But here's what I really want you to see here at the end. Like a lot of stocks have done in this market, the stock got very popular, had tremendous momentum, and you could have made a fortune buying this stock. Now, you could have bought it back here when it was attractively valued. You'd still be looking at a very, very attractive return, almost 40% a year. But of course, at one point, if you'd have bought it here when it was trading at, you know, at a P.E. ratio that was you know, reasonable compared to its growth, your rate of return would have been 80% annualized. You'd have had an 800% gain in these years. That's why people were attracted, and I'm sure that's why people asked me. But now since it peaked here, now you've, you know, you've experienced a 50% drop in value, and I still consider the stock overvalued at these levels. Now looking at it today, it's down, you know, 0.8%, $4.53 today. I think there's still valuation risk in this company. I don't see it, you know, being extremely cheap now. But having said that, it's probably within a normal valuation range if the company does grow at 26% for, you know, on average for the next two or three years, which are what, you know, the analysts, there are 13 or 14 analysts following this company. The longer term growth, is expected to be 23%. That would still make it attractive, you know, giving you the potential for double digit rates of return. So here's a case where the correction really gave you an opportunity, perhaps, to be able to look at this stock and an attract. But this is a growth stock valuation. I want to make that clear. I'm looking at a PE ratio of equal to the growth rate of 26%. It's currently trading at a 30 PE. But again, I can overpay for a stock that's growing this fast and still expect to make double digit rates of return. Anyway, this is our subscriber request Tuesday video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope there was a lot of lessons here, a lot of different kind of stocks. I wish I could cover more stocks for you. But here were 10 stocks that you've all asked to see. If you like the video, ring the bell, give me a like. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I do this subscriber request stuff every Tuesday for you. So anyway, this is Chuck Carnival saying thanks for watching.